the Routiers had it all. A big Texas house, and even bigger dreams. Then someone took it all away. In a savage instant, two young boys are murdered. As we walked into the den, you could see the blood stains on the carpet. Their mother's throat slashed. Whoever killed these boys meant to kill Darley. Who did this? The hunt for a killer is on. Drops of blood, tiny fibers left behind, mark the killer's trail. We performed over 100 DNA analysis in this case. As evidence is found, different theories emerge. Tangled plots are uncovered that tell a tale of greed and betrayal. Beneath the surface, you had real problems. I did not murder my kids. He is a uh, sociopathic and pathological liar. Will forensic science catch a killer or frame an innocent victim? June 6, 1996. A quiet night in Rowlett, Texas is torn by sirens. Oh my God! 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 Oh my God!
Charlie tells officers at the scene that startled from her sleep, she struggled with an intruder, then chased him through the house. A glass shatters to the floor. He drops a bloody knife on the way. And then the man disappears into the garage. Darley's throat has been cut. Her boys have been stabbed. She yells for her husband. Then calls 911. By the time Darren Routier gets to the living room, it's too late. Bleeding from a savage neck wound, Darley Routier is rushed to the closest major hospital, the Baylor University Medical Center in nearby Dallas. When at three o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call and it was the nurse across the street and she blurted out that Devin and Damon were dead and that Darley was dying. With Darley fighting for her life, investigators start combing the house for clues. The best chance they have to catch the killer is to move fast. Greg Davis was the assistant district attorney for the Rowlett area. From the very first moment that we walked in the home, it was obvious that the blood evidence would be key in this case. The carpet is soaked in blood. There are signs of a violent struggle. The trail continues in the kitchen. The murder weapon left behind. A boot print has been preserved in blood. A torn screen is discovered in the garage. A blood-stained sock is found in the alley behind the house. And there are reports that a dark-colored sedan was cruising the area just before the attack. It all paints a picture of a killer on the run. While Darley is in surgery, police begin their search for a brutal killer. Routine police investigation finds that Darley and Darren Routier were high school sweethearts. I'll get a better sleep down here. You want to sleep with me? No, you go on upstairs. Got an early day in 1996, day, so Darren was running a successful there. business in computer I parts. I love you, sweetie. Mm. Darley did the books. They had three children, a big Texas house, and by all accounts, a close relationship. Oh, you remember to lock the door? All right, check. Good night. But on that hot June night in 1996, things would change forever. By 6 a.m., her house is a crime scene. Her two oldest sons are dead, and she is badly wounded. Dr. Vincent DeMaio is the chief medical examiner for Bear County, Texas. What she had was an incised wound, a cut or a slashing wound uh, of the uh, right side of the neck that went downward towards the left side. And then there was another cut on the front of her left shoulder, which was, could very well have been a continuation of this. And she also had a very deep stab wound of her right forearm where the blade actually went down to the bone. When a doctor came in a couple hours later, I remember him holding my hand and telling me that the throat wound came within one millimeter of her carotid artery. That's like the thickness of a cigarette paper. 
And if that would have penetrated that, Darley would be dead. In the days to come, enormous bruises, stretching from her wrist to her shoulders, would emerge on Darley's arms. They're the injuries of a woman who was fighting for her life. Detective Jim Patterson is a lead investigator on the case. Hours after the attack, he talks to Darley as she recovers in hospital. I met with Darley about four hours after uh, the incident at the house. I met with her at the hospital. Darley, can you tell me what happened up at the house? Just start at the beginning. She was alert. She was conscious. She knew exactly what she was saying. I woke up and I saw someone standing over me with a knife in his hands. We struggled. Then he just walked off through the kitchen into the utility room. I saw him drop the knife. And I picked it up. I probably shouldn't have done that. And I put the knife on the kitchen counter. And then I saw David standing in the hallway. And David was just, just lying there. And I called 911. It's a slightly different story than she first gave police. And Darley can only provide sketchy details of her attacker. He wore black clothes, had bushy hair, and a baseball cap. It's all police have to go on. Armed with Darley's statement, police search for evidence that corroborates Darley's story of an intruder. Now, what about this? Now, this uh, knife, that's exactly where I found just when, when I came in. Rowlett police call in James Cron, a former member of the Dallas County Sheriff's Department. Cron is now a crime scene consultant who has investigated more than 20,000 crime scenes. First thing we did in standard step is to do a walkthrough and that is a very careful walk where you do nothing, touch nothing, but except observe the scene. They begin their investigation in the blood-soaked family room. What they find is a puzzling collection of clues. If Darley was attacked while she slept on the couch, why is there hardly any blood on the pillow? The couch below isn't ripped or torn. In the kitchen, shards of broken glass litter the floor. She heard a glass break as the intruder ran through the kitchen. She then followed after the intruder. And yet, when we got there and we looked at it, her bloody footprints are underneath the glass that was supposedly broken before she ever ran through the kitchen. Now, that didn't make any sense. Even more perplexing, only one bloody boot print is found. But the blood trail ends there. There's no blood at all in the garage. A small collection of Darley's jewelry sits on a counter in the kitchen. If this was a robbery, why wasn't it taken? The clues are even more confusing outside the house beginning with a bloody sock that is discovered in the alley. We determined that sock actually came from inside the Routier home. We were able to match some of the fibers on that sock to tennis shoes belonging to Darren. The blood on Darren Routier's sock is eventually matched to that of the two murdered boys. But how did it get there? Did you notice any bloody footprint? Nothing. It was completely unmarked. This gate was closed. Uh -huh, that's right. But the hinges are out. It's uh, held together by a wire here. Kron finds no sign of a frantic getaway. 
If the intruder left through the garage and the bloody sock is in the alley, Kron should be able to find evidence that the intruder came through here, but he can't. I began about 30 minutes, and uh, the Raleigh police did do that we felt like there was no intruder. So we had to focus on who was in the house, okay? Well, it's obvious that the infant didn't, didn't kill his brothers and, and stab his mother, so then you have to look at the husband. Darren, I know it's been a horrible night. Yeah. You know, I really love Darla. She is so beautiful, don't you think? Darren comes up to me, and, and this is the first thing he says. He talks about how big his uh, wife's breasts are. He talks about how pretty his wife is. He talks about that this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in the city of Rowlett. Uh, he doesn't ask me about his children. Uh, so I just found his actions to be a little strange. So beautiful, you know. It leads Patterson to another horrifying theory. Perhaps Darren Routier himself had murdered his own children. Within days of the murder of their two children, both Darren and Darley Routier are brought to the Roulette police station. It takes them more than an hour to fill out voluntary statements about what happened the night of the murders. Darren repeats the version of events he told police at the scene, that he was asleep when he heard Darley screaming for help. He rushed downstairs, but was too late to save his children. <laughs> Darley's story, though, starts to change. The next thing I, I wake up and I feel pressure on me. I felt Damon press on my right shoulder and I heard him cry. This made me really come awake and realize, realize there, there was, was a man standing down at my feet, walking away from me, walked after him, heard glass breaking, ran, turned on the light. I ran back towards the utility room, realized that there was a big white handled knife laying on the floor. It was then I realized I had blood all over me, and I grabbed the knife thinking he was in I ran back through the kitchen and realized that the entire living room had blood all over it, everything. I put the knife back on the counter and I ran to the entrance, turned on the light and I started screaming for Darren. It's the most detailed description yet of what happened and it's not the same story she told Patterson at the hospital. We understand that people are gonna change some of their stories. Uh, you know, it might have been a black car instead of a blue car, that kind of stuff, but you don't change the whole dynamics of it and that's what she did. In Darley's new version, there is no struggle with the intruder. Darley's youngest boy was awake and standing by her shoulder. There are important differences which make investigators take a very close look at the crime scene. Evidence from the Routier house is starting to pour in. Oh, there, see, that's not underneath. underneath so. We held the scene for 13 days. We pro actively processed it for 11 days. So we were very thorough. Uh, if there was a book, we flipped through every page. If there was a picture, it came off the wall. They analyzed everything they could possibly analyze. They fingerprinted the entire house. They took the carpet. They took the kitchen sink. We performed over 100 DNA analysis in this case. If there was a struggle between Darley and her intruder, as she first told officers, there should be long, thin lines of blood along the ground and the walls. These splatters would have been thrown off as a bleeding Darley fought with the intruder. But investigators can't find any such blood splatters. If Darley had chased her attacker through the house when she was wounded, she would have left long, thin streaks of blood behind. Blood falling from a moving object, such as someone running, leaves an elongated mark, not a round blood stain. 
Investigators can't find any of these marks either. In the utility room, where Darley says the killer threw the knife down, there is blood. But that, too, doesn't look like it should. What we did after the knife had been processed for latent prints and DNA evidence is we, we got the original knife, brought it back to the house, and, and got two units of blood. We put blood on the knife, we used the same floor, and we dropped the knife from different heights to see what type of blood patterns that that would leave on it. And we found that we saw a very distinct V-shaped pattern each and every time that we dropped the knife in the utility room, and there was no pattern like that when we first got there. And again, that was very disheartening, it was discouraging, because again, it pointed toward Miss Routier. Investigators also recreate her movements throughout the house. She indicated to us that she ran through the crime scene, and so we laid out some butcher paper and inked up her feet and had her walk. Then we also re-inked her and had her run, you know, 20 feet on the butcher paper to see what her stride was and measured that. And we were able to look at those front footprints in the kitchen, and it was telling us that she walked through the kitchen. She wasn't running through the kitchen. Investigators are also interested that Darley's feet have no scratches or cuts. If the intruder had knocked the wine glass on the floor, why hadn't Darley stepped on any of the broken glass? An innocent explanation is also found for the only other footprint in the house. The only bloody shoe print in the kitchen leading to the utility room belonged to one of the first responders. What we do is, is that we make sure that we have uh, prints of ever worn shoes to match up to the prints or the physical evidence on the floor or any place else that we can. Most damning of all is the evidence of blood found on the countertop and the sink. Even when blood is cleaned up, an invisible residue often remains behind. But when treated with a chemical called luminol, the blood trails begin to glow under ultraviolet light. So we blacked out the house, covered the windows, and, and sprayed the sink area and took a photograph of that. That reacted positive for blood and indicated to us that there had been a cleanup there by the sink. Patterson is growing more and more convinced that after stabbing her own children, Darley Routier stabbed herself to make it look like she was attacked. Patterson gets a second opinion of Darley's injuries from one of the doctors who worked at the hospital. So what do you think? Yes, she could have done it herself. So you're saying that Darley stabbed herself? I'm saying that these wounds could have been self-inflicted, yes. One last tiny piece of evidence helps the Rowlett police make up their mind. What becomes known as knife number four is found in the Routier kitchen. It has a tiny fiber clinging to it, a fiber which matches the screen that was cut in the garage. The only way it could get there was if someone inside the house took it, cut the screen, then put it back in the block. Based on the evidence, the police can come to only one conclusion. Darley Routier murdered her own children. It's a chilling thought, but the big question now is, why? Sunday, June 9th, 1996. Three days after their murder, a funeral is held for Devon and Damon Routier. More than 400 people turn out. But the suspicions of the police are growing. They can't find any traces of an intruder in or around the house. I instinctively wanted someone else to be there. I wanted an intruder to have broken into that house because the last thing that I wanted to believe was that a mother would actually kill her two children. But the evidence was piling up. The question now was why. What could have driven Darley Routier to commit such a shocking crime? As police learn more, they discover that the Routiers were having problems. The Routiers wanted to paint themselves as the typical all-American family, and yet but beneath the surface, you saw difficulties. So you had a very thin veneer of normalcy out there, but beneath the surface, you had real problems. The evening of the murders, the talk wasn't just sweet good nights. Should you be comfortable down here? Yeah, I'll be fine. 
Darren, we have to talk. About what? What's the about everything. When are you going to get your car fixed so that I can have mine? I mean, we can't go anywhere. I just feel like I'm trapped in this house. Just keep your voice down. I don't want to wake the boys. It's going to cost us 800 bucks to get that car dogs. fixed. And I'm going to sell the boat because it's not working out the way I thought it would. I'll just get my car. Did you remember to lock the door? Oh, it's sure. The couple was financially strapped and they owed more than $10,000 in back taxes to the IRS. During her pregnancy with her third child, Darley had been depressed, staying in her room for days, even weeks at a time. A diary found in their house confirms that Darley had struggled with depression after the baby was born. A month before the murders, Darley had written, Devin, Damon, Drake, I hope one day you will forgive me for what I'm about to do. I just can't find the strength to keep fighting anymore. Is this a damaging portrait of a suicidal woman under severe stress, or a mother about to commit murder? And then comes one of the strangest moments of all. June 14th, Eight days after the murders, Devin Routier would have turned seven. The family decides to hold a long-planned birthday party for the young boy at his grave. For two hours, it's a somber service. But the most telling moment comes near the end. Prompted by her sister, Darley sprays a can of silly string over the grave of her two boys. I think we saw the real Darley Routier at that, uh, that gravesite party. You know, and I kept thinking as I saw that, I'm a parent. If my child had died a week earlier, would I be in any condition to even talk about it? And yet, here's a mother sitting out there singing, spraying silly string, giving interviews without any sort of emotion. It was bizarre, it was despicable. It really made my stomach turn as I watched her there at that gravesite. Darley's mother has a very different view of the incident. That just is a pure example of how you are when you're in grief, because you're crazy when you're in that kind of trauma. You don't believe they're dead one minute, and the next minute, you know, you, you might be laughing, and the next you might be, you know, just crying your eyes out. But this is just something simple. But it made Darley look bad by the way they slowed down her chewing the gum and smiling and spraying silly string as if she didn't care, where the whole purpose of that was, it was to do it in their honor, and it was something that they would have loved. After the graveside ceremony, Patterson decides to question Darley again. He brings her to the Rowlett police station one last time. I'm good, nice to meet you, sir. Bill Parker has been doing interrogations for 20 years. Patterson hopes he'll finally be able to get Darley to confess. I have a copy of your voluntary statement here. Is there anything you'd like to add? No, that is exactly what happened. Darley, I have a couple of questions about this statement. Mm -hmm. For three hours, Parker grills Darley about the facts of the case. Six times, he accuses her directly of killing her children. I think you killed Damon and Devon. Five times, she responds, Well, if I did it, I don't remember. But there's no confession. In all my years, I have never heard anything that unusual. Here's a woman, a stranger, accusing you of killing your children, and your response is, If I did it, I don't remember? Even without a confession, Patterson is convinced his case is solid. He arrests Darley Routier for the murder of her two sons. You're under arrest for the murder of your two boys. Yeah, I think when we look at her mugshot, we see that pained expression. I don't think it's any pain for those two children. I think it's the pain of, you know what, they're actually going to charge me with this offense and I'm not going to get away with it. At approximately 10.20 p.m. this evening, investigators from the Rowlett Police Department arrested Darlie Routier, white female, age 26, 
I cannot comment on the details of this investigation other than to say we believe that the white male suspect described by Darlie Routier as the man that attacked her and murdered her children never existed. Darlie's family is bewildered. I saw her arrested on TV at 10 o'clock news. You know, after she went up there for, I don't know how many visits with the police, her and Darren went up and, um, you know, they gave them everything. I mean, anything they asked for. The journey from innocent victim to accused murderer takes just 12 days. Darlie Routier is now Texas prisoner 010470. January 6, 1997, seven months after the death of Devin and Damon Routier, their mother Darley goes on trial for their murder. Greg Davis is the lead prosecutor for the state of Texas. In Texas, if you kill a, a, a child younger than six years of age, you've committed a capital murder. That's what we allege in this case. That's why Darley was charged with capital murder. For that reason, Darley is only on trial for the murder of Damon Routier, who was five when he was killed. If convicted, the state wants Darley put to death. Her family is outraged and confused. What did you say for them to think that you had anything to do with this? She goes, I don't know, Mom. The Darley Routier case was a, a very uh, challenging case. Uh, it depended on a number of pieces of evidence. And it was challenging from the standpoint that we're going to try to convince a jury that a mother would actually kill her two children in cold blood. The case turns on the forensic evidence gathered at the crime scene. The lack of an impact blood stain in the utility room where the knife was dropped. The lack of evidence of any intruder outside the house. Another damaging forensic test is entered into evidence. Blood from one of the boys is found on the back of Darley's nightshirt. A Texas expert on bloodstains recreates the movements Darley would have made if she had stabbed her children. Blood from the knife falls on the shirt as the knife is raised for each blow. The trail of blood he recreates matches the trail on Darley's shirt. That evidence on her nightshirt was very convincing. It was very conclusive. There was no other reasonable explanation as to how the blood of Damon and Devon could possibly be upon her nightshirt. Finally, the jury is shown footage of the graveside party for Devon. While the ceremony was two hours long, the jury is only shown the infamous silly string section. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Happy birthday to you. Love you, Devin and Damon. Davis tells the jury that Darley staged the entire scene. While her children sleep, Darley takes a knife from the kitchen and slices the screen open. She then takes another knife from the kitchen and kills her two sons. She takes one of her husband's socks and makes sure it has blood on it. The sock is then dropped in the alley. She cuts her own neck and in a frenzy beats her arms and wrists. She makes it look like a killer has fled. Then calls for help. Darley's defense focuses on the wound to Darley's neck. Vincent DeMaio, a seasoned medical examiner, takes the stand. One of the things I asked was, is she right-handed or left-handed? And she's right-handed. If she inflicted this wound, she would have had to have used the left hand. And then she would have had to have stabbed herself deeply in the right forearm. When you consider the injuries by themselves, the injuries have more of the appearance of somebody who has been attacked than someone who has self-inflicted the wounds. As for the blood on Darley's nightshirt, the defense has another theory. It could be cast off from gloves that the EMS had, or it could be from the knife 
that she was attacked with because if that knife was used to kill the children, their blood would be on it. Like others, Demaya believes that Darley was awake when she was attacked, but the violence of the attack and the shock of seeing her boys dead has scarred her memory. And a very different picture is painted of Darley as a mother. Come on, give me some popcorn for your brother. Oh, yeah. Perfect. You want to drink that? She loved those boys. And, you know, the prosecutor, Mr. Davis, said that Darley just got tired and they interfered with her lifestyle, so she killed them. Why would she kill the two older boys and not the baby who would be the most burdensome? I absolutely know that Darley's innocent. In just five weeks, the trial is over. The fate of Darley Routier is in the hands of the jurors. It takes them less than a day to decide Darley's fate. Uh, I'll never forget the jury, uh, the jury wanting the pictures of those two children placed out there as they came back to return their verdict. And, and they wanted those two pictures there so that Darley Routier would have to see those two pictures because throughout this trial, Darley attempted to make herself the victim. And I always felt it was important to remind that jury and to remind the public that there were two real victims here, two young boys. And I was really heartened by the fact that, that jury got it. I mean, they understood who the victims were, and they wanted Darley Routier to remember that and to recognize that, too. And that was really a defining moment for me. When the jury was deliberating, I really thought that she would be found either innocent or a hung jury. And when they came in and said that they found her guilty, I absolutely just... It went crazy. That was the worst part. Darley Routier is found guilty of murdering her youngest son, Damon. She is sentenced to die by lethal injection. But almost as soon as the verdict is handed down, serious questions begin to surface about the trial and the science behind her conviction. In 1997, the state of Texas put 37 people to death. After her conviction in January, Darlie Routier took her place on the state's death row. In Texas, every case that ends in a death penalty is automatically appealed. Stephen Cooper becomes Darlie's lawyer. The police did little to no investigation of any intruder. Their sworn testimony was at within minutes virtually of arriving on the scene that despite all the Darley's massive injuries they concluded uh, she had was the perpetrator. Cooper hires a private investigator to re-examine the evidence. He pours over everything. Police reports, eyewitness accounts, expert testimony. The P.I. quickly uncovers suspicions pointing towards the man police suspected at the beginning, Darren Routier, Darley's husband. We do have evidence now that Darren Routier was actively seeking someone to come into the home to do a inside job burglary for insurance purposes. In a sworn affidavit to Cooper, Darren admits to looking for someone to break into his house. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning or 2.30, they sneak into this nice-looking house thinking they're going to, you know, make a successful burglary. And they creep in, and there in the living room, they stumble across human beings who are not upstairs in bed where they should be at 2.30 in the morning. A get-rich-quick scheme ends in murder. Members of Darren Routier's family asked Texas millionaire Brian Pardo to get involved. A self-proclaimed advocate for the wrongly convicted, Pardo launches an independent investigation that costs as much as $120,000. I agree that nobody came into the house. I agree that there was an appearance to make it look like somebody came into the house through the screen and used 
the bread knife for that purpose. So the police were right in taking a hard look at the family. We, we agreed with that. We just didn't feel they took a very hard look at Darren. As part of Pardo's investigation, Darren Routier agrees to take a lie detector test about the night of the murders. The results are a bombshell. Are you Darren Routier? Yes. Were you involved in a plot to commit a crime in your home on June 6, 1996? No. Did you yourself stab Darlene Routier on June 6, 1996? No. Do you know exactly who let the sock in the alley? No. Can you name the person who stabbed your sons? No. It's a short test, just four questions. But the examiner says the results show that Darren was lying when he answered each one of the questions. Darren failed the test three times. And he failed it so utterly that the examiner, who was connected with the Waco PD, actually went around, sat in front of him, and tried to extract the confession from him. You know, I really would have liked to see you pass. But I don't believe for a minute. I came here to pass. No. You came here because you lied to people all your life and gotten away with it. I did not lie. And in the short run, You've got to live with the knowledge you've gotten away with murder. But in the long run, it'll catch up with you. I did not murder my kids. Darren maintains his innocence in the crime, but Pardo is deeply suspicious. Darren, um, our assessment of him was that he is a sociopathic and pathological liar. Darren Routier calls the lie detector test a setup and lie detector results are not admissible in court. But in an affidavit, Darren admits for the very first time that on the night of the murders, Darley had asked for a separation. Two times prior to this, Darren became violent when she said that she was considering leaving him. The first time he pointed a loaded pistol at his head, according to Darley, and got her hysterical and threatened to kill himself. Do what? What don't you want me to do? Don't pursue The second time, she said, he pointed a gun at her and threatened to kill her. You're going to leave me, darling. Is that what you're going to do? Is that what you're going to do? The new evidence creates yet another theory about what happened in the Routier's home the night that Devin and Damon were killed. Is she going to be talking about him? Yeah, I'll be fine. Darren, we need to talk. About what? I want a separation. Let's talk about this in the morning. I'm too tired for this. I'm serious. I know. Brian Pardo is convinced that it wasn't an intruder at all who killed the two retired children, and it wasn't their mother either. Did you remember to lock the door? Oh, did you? Each of the children had just $5,000 in life insurance. Darley's life was insured for $200,000. For Pardo, that is the motive for the attack. It was Darren that was applying the stress. It was Darren who had the financial problems. And Darren was the one who needed the, the money. And uh, so Darren had a huge motive for doing this. Not the least of which was he was not going to let his wife leave him. Pardo believes that, with the help of an accomplice, Darren attacked Darley first. The bruises on Darley's arms were caused by the struggle. Of course, there was a lot of screaming going on, a lot of noise. The boys woke up. The boys saw the attack. I think that instinctively, the attackers realized that the boys had to be killed as well. Darley, I think, was pounded into submission was unconscious. I think the attackers thought that she was dead. Pardo is convinced that a closer study will prove that Darley Routier is innocent of the murder of her two boys.
June 2005. Dolly Rutier's lawyer, Stephen Cooper, still believes forensics will clear his client. One of the best chances she has for the appeal is a tiny, smudged fingerprint. Cooper has a possible motive pointing to someone else committing the murders of Devon and Damon Routier. What he doesn't have is any proof that someone else was in the house. That's about to change. When investigators examined the Routier's house, all fingerprints they found were conclusively identified. However, one print found on the glass tabletop was considered too incomplete to match to anyone. There was a uh, smudged print that was located on this uh, glass tabletop. Uh, there was not anything that we could find that uh, made us believe that that one smudged print belonged to someone different. You know, it could still belong to Darley. It could still belong to Darren. Uh, I believe that it uh, small enough it could, you know, even belong to one of the children. But that's something the defense is looking at because we don't have an answer for it. While it couldn't be used for identification, during Darley's trial, experts for the state testified that it was consistent with that made by a five or six-year-old child. Even though Patterson thinks the print isn't clear enough to be useful, Stephen Cooper finds an expert who disagrees. Robert Lonis is a retired New York City Police Department uh, identification expert. Um, he's identified seven or eight points for comparison purposes which is enough, in his opinion, to be run through the APHIS Federal uh, National uh, Fingerprint Database. And uh, the state won't allow us access. Cooper wants to rule out the possibility that one of the two murdered boys could have left the print. There is only one problem. Unbelievably, and again against standard protocol, Neither one of the boys were fingerprinted at the medical examiner's office. That again is just unheard of. To rule out that the fingerprint was made by either boy, Cooper takes an extreme step. The bodies of both Devon and Damon are exhumed. It's dramatic move that is ultimately a dead end. Unfortunately, they were buried in the same casket with their hands clasped together and again the, the although they were not supposed to the, the the caskets had leaked and the moisture had uh, and the contact between the fingers had destroyed some of the skin and we weren't, weren't able to recover all the fingerprints while the fingerprints are gone cooper wants to re-examine the small fiber that was found on the knife in the kitchen he has serious doubts that it was actually used to cut the screen in the garage. This is a segment of fiber that is one-tenth the width of a Caucasian human hair. It is microscopic, to say the least. They did not do any scientific testing analysis of its chemical makeup, which was possible. There are other pieces of evidence Cooper would love to retest, including the actual fingerprint on the glass table, which may contain skin cells. But he has yet to get the courts to give him access. A new witness has come forward. She claims to have seen two men near the Routier house about 2 a.m. the night of the murders. One who matched the description Darley gave to the police. Cooper also believes the crime scene was badly contaminated by the police. The vacuum cleaner was not knocked over by Darley as part of staging the crime scene. It was moved by the police. And, and in a new trial, I have an expert who will testify about that. You get an overzealous prosecutor, you get a, a bunch of rookie police officers that had no idea how to even take fingerprints, you get people that are in shock running in and out uh, through glass and blood and, you know, touching things and moving things. But to date, all of Darley's appeals have been turned down. The court has not granted her request to retest the forensic evidence, and no new trial has been announced.
to uh, say that it was a conspiracy or that anything was mishandled and she's wrongfully accused is, uh, is not true. She wouldn't be where she is today if she hadn't killed those children. If we were to do it again today, I'd ask for the same punishment because those two boys deserved that type of justice. She's a dangerous, manipulative individual who's shown absolutely no remorse for her actions, and she deserves the death penalty in this particular case. Forensics may yet clear Darley Routier. Smeared fingerprints may confirm that someone else was in the house the night her sons were murdered. For now, a story that began with a terrified 911 call has ended on death row.